I've got the genes, like all of them, that would make me a very violent, dangerous person. It's just a, kind of a quirk. I'm a neuroscientist and my research, my interests have been half in adult stem cells throughout my career and also in psychiatry. And within psychiatry, we're very interested in the genetics of psychiatric disorders, schizophrenia, depression, and uh, also as part of that, uh, for the past about 18 years, uh, my colleagues have uh, given me imaging uh, pictures of brains of killers who are in trial or you know, going to trial and send, they say, What's he, what, what do you see? The working hypothesis is that there are three key ingredients for psychopathology, including of psychopathic killers, for example. These three things, first, genetics, and that is that they carry one or more, there's at least 10 of them, but one or more of these high-risk violence-related genes. The second part is some sort of loss of brain function of an area of the frontal lobe right above the eyes called orbital cortex. That's the area that codes for it. It's in the circuit that codes for ethics and morality, conscience. When that's gone, or never develops, a person doesn't have a good sense of ethics and morality, but also it controls impulse. So it's impulse control. So usually people with this kind of uh, damage not only uh, don't have an ethics or morality or conscience about what they're doing, but they're also very impulsive about it. That's the second thing. So it's a brain damage, the genetics. The third key thing is abuse. And how that early childhood abuse, very severe abuse, sexual, emotional, uh, physical abuse, those three things put together seem to be the key elements. And when they happen, when the brain damage happens, when the abuse happens, is thought to uh, be involved with the kind of psych psychopath you have. Genetics in the past two years has undergone a revolution that's quite incredible. And now we're able to use mathematical models and really associate networks of genes that people have and the risk for all sorts of behavior, you know, from ulcers all the way up to psychopathology. I think it's going to have a, a tremendous impact from this day forward uh, in understanding psychopathology and perhaps how it's used in the law, too. We have a convicted felon. Can, a, you know, can that felon just say, look, my, my brain made me do it? Well, yeah, I'm sure your brain made you do it, but is it something you have any control over? Uh, this is a question that for every person is going to be a, a different answer. Uh, in a sense, yeah, their brain made them do it. But does that mean that they're not responsible for their activity? No, that does not mean they're not responsible for what they did. You can explain it and say, I did it for that. And you're so fine, I mean, you know, it's too bad. We're sorry about that, but we have to put you away, you know, if it goes that way. So, uh, but it still helps you understand the person, why they did it, you know, and how it came about. It may not affect how long they're in jail or anything else, but at least we know and they know. Maybe it can help them. I think one has to be careful on how you define free will. If you take uh, psychopathic killers, for example, uh, they may kill uh, when they're 18, and then they may kill again when they're 28. Well, were they express, you know, were they showing much free will during that time period? But then they kill three more people and eight more people. 20 years go by and they've killed 35 people. One could say, in those times they weren't killing, they had free will and they were suppressing it. Uh, I don't look at it exactly that way. I look at the whole pattern of behavior and say, you know, it's just like going to the bathroom. You may put it off. You may put it off, but it's going to happen. In that sense, uh, I really don't think there's much free will that's really implied there. A psychopath is somebody who is not really in control. Uh, they have a, you know, very flat affect. The way they relate to people is very different. They, they're, they're pretty much cold in the loop, but they would be very charming, too. They can put on a great act. And so they can show some control, but part of it is manipulation, too. So ultimately, they, are, they may not be in control, really, as, uh, in, in the sense we think, of ultimately what they're going to do. But they have enough control, little pieces of their behavior, that they can navigate through the world in, in, in pretty bad ways. It'll be interesting to see how, what role, ultimately, neuroscience plays in public policy. Uh, the problem for a scientist, a neuroscientist, is we now know more and more about not only the genetics, but how every person is really an individual. There's no 
two people alike. Even, indiv even identical twins are not identical now. To treat everybody individually, everybody becomes a special case. This is not what you want in public policy. Public policy is you apply standard. And really, in a sense, there is no standard to a neuroscientist because everybody's different. It's a bit like big pharma wanting one pill to take care of depression and one pill to take care of ADHD and one pill to take care of infection. It turns out they've come kicking and screaming into accepting the past year or two that they're this individualized medicine, that everybody is different, everybody reacts to drugs differently, some drugs work wonderfully, but they can't use that one drug anymore for that one syndrome. It's a good business model, but it's bad neuroscience, it's bad clinical medicine. The same way, governments tend to treat everybody as the same. You know, they have to in a way. It's an even fair uh, applicational law. But this violates all the individuality that is really in us. Uh, and it really is very limiting. You know how the law is an ass at a very fundamental level. I think uh, government is an ass at a very fundamental level that is not commensurate with uh, individual potential, human potential, way beyond what we thought it was. It's unworkable. My mother said at a, a barbecue that we had, a family barbecue, she pulled me aside and she said, you know, you're doing all these talks around the world and around the country about psychopathic killers. Uh, you got to watch out what you say because it turns out there's this book that just came out on your family, uh, the Cornells, and she said in this book uh, there's a line of uh, seven killers from them to you starting in 1667 uh, with Thomas Cornell who killed his mother. Lizzie Borden was a famous case in the late 19th century. She was well known for chopping up her parents, mother and father, took an ax and uh, killed them. She's a cousin of ours, so this is this whole dark history of uh, violence and murder in her family. As it turns out, I have uh, the brain pattern of, of a psychopath. I've got the genes, like all of them, that would make me a very violent, dangerous person. But that doesn't mean somebody with this pattern where the frontal lobe orbital cortex turned off, is going to be a killer. It means that they're going to have a, probably a flat emotional affect, they're going to be superficially charming. Usually risk takers, which I am, bon vivants, which I am, can be clowns, which I am. Uh, and, but you also see this in sociopaths and psychopaths too, where they have the superficial charm. And so there is some overlap. It's just that I'm not, I'm not violent, but I hate to lose at Scrabble. You know, I, I play get sublimated, I guess, a little bit. And, uh, and the one thing that isn't there, the one ingredient, is, is I was never abused, and I had a wonderful childhood that apparently protected me in some way from this kind of funky biology. I'm a, I happen to be a libertarian, I have been since 1970. You know, with, with people like libertarians that were so logical, uh, it's a very strong, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which is right here, and this whole stream going, it's almost like a yarmulke or a hat that you'd wear. It's the area right under a yarmulke, right? Though that's really the cold cognition and the, you know, reason and executive function. This is the group where you'd, you'd see, maybe there'd be nothing going on down here too much, like the psychopath, but this would be so strong that they could reason away conflicts. Okay, so maybe that's true. It'd be worth looking at. I think it'd be a, a fascinating study, uh, because but nobody ever looks at libertarians' brains, that's for sure. <laughs>